Hello everyone, my name is Shakiba Shayani and I'm the President and CEO of the Guelph Chamber of Commerce and I will be the moderator this afternoon. As a leading voice of business, the Guelph Chamber is pleased to be hosting this debate today. I'd like to welcome everyone and would like to thank our local real estate board, the Guelph and District Association of Realtors for helping make this debate possible today. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that today we are on the treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the New Credit Nation of the Anishinaabe peoples. During our region's rich history, indigenous history, these lands have been home to the Atawandaran, the Haudenosaunee, and the Anishinaabe and the Métis. We express gratitude for the sharing of these lands. We acknowledge the tragic history between indigenous peoples and settlers. And we arrive to be accountable by acknowledging this history and cultivating respect in our relationships with Indigenous peoples and the land. I'll now review the format we'll be using this afternoon. The order in which candidates will speak will be done in alphabetical order of the candidates' last names. First, each candidate will be allowed a three, minute, uh, three minutes for opening remarks, and then we'll move into the debate. The questions have come from members of the Guelph Chamber and members of the community. The topics we will cover today include affordability, childcare, truth and reconciliation, healthcare, the economy and post-pandemic recovery, and climate change. Each candidate will have an opportunity to answer every question. Candidates, you will be given one minute to answer the question and you will be able to monitor your time on the screen. Hopefully, that's the tech we're working through. Please note that in the interest of time, each candidate may be cut off after the allotted time has passed. The order questions are answered will be identified by myself on a rotating basis. Candidates, you will have an opportunity for a rebuttal if you or your party have been directly named by another candidate. In addition, rebuttals have the following rules. Rebuttals will not be allowed based on comments made during opening and closing remarks. A request for a rebuttal will be signaled to me by you using a raise hand function in Zoom. There are no rebuttals to rebuttals. My decisions as moderator will be final and do note that rebuttals are limited to one minute. Lastly, each candidate will be given the opportunity for a closing statement. The candidate order will be reversed from the introductions at the start and closing statements are limited to 90 seconds in length. So that we can get through as many questions as possible, we ask that other candidates be respectful of the time and as always of each other. Candidates, please also be sure to mute yourself when you are not speaking. Okay, I would like to introduce candidates in alphabetical order of last name. Let me just check in on our timer before we begin. Okay, it appears we're very close to getting the timer on the screen so that we can all see. In the meantime, we'll use some old school technology on our phones and keep track of time. My colleague will make a note in the chat box that you folks can all see when you have half of your time left. So in this case, at a minute and a half, you'll be notified in the chat box that you have only another minute and a half for your opening remarks. Okay, so let us begin with introductions. To start, Michelle Bowman, Green Party of Canada. Michelle? Thanks very much for the Im invitation. I'm super excited to tell you what the Greens have to offer. I became a candidate for three reasons. The first was to tackle the climate crisis while at the same time capitalizing on the enormous potential of the green economy that we have. So a green recovery. The pandemic was predictable, preventable, and Canada was caught relatively unprepared. 
Greenhouse gas emissions are rising when they should be falling. We haven't met a target in the last few years. And I think I'll make a case today that the Greens have the best plan to tackle the climate emergency. Again, we have this enormous economic opportunity for a green recovery. The second reason was dignity for all in a just society. So the Greens really want to fix, mend all the holes in our social safety net. And the pandemic showed that there were quite a few. One of the main ways we hope to do this is with guaranteed livable income. And we'd also declare a housing emergency. We're very concerned about ongoing systemic racism and rising hate in our communities. The final reason I wanted to become a candidate is because I think we can have better governance. We need to rebuild our nation to nation relationship with Indigenous people. Proportional representation is long overdue and long over promise, so we want to have a citizens assembly. And the main reason we'd like proportional representation, obviously, so everyone has a say, everyone's vote counts. But perhaps more importantly, so that governments can work together towards a common goal. Right now, our system is set up to be adversarial. And I think Canadians want and Canadians deserve governments that can work together towards common goals. Those are the three reasons I became a candidate. Thank you, Michelle. To you, Aisha John Gere from the New Democratic Party of Canada. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Aisha John Gere, and I would first like to thank the Guelph Chamber of Commerce for bringing us all here today. On September 20th, Canadians across the country have a choice a choice between voting for the parties that have failed to deliver on promise after promise time and time again, or voting for Jagmeet Singh and the New Democratic Party who are fighting for you. On September 20th, you can make the better choice. All over the country, families are seriously concerned about the climate crisis, the healthcare of our loved ones, jobs, and about the public services that everyone relies on. We've seen throughout the past 18 months that Canada is a resilient nation that can confront any challenge when we have to, when we choose to, and when we come together. But the past 18 months have also shown us that thanks to the decisions made by the Liberals and the, cover and the Conservative governments, many of the supports that Canadians rely on just weren't there when we needed them the most. To get different re results, we must make different choices. What we need right now is the courage to act together. And that is exactly what New Democrats offer to Canadians and what I wanna to offer to the people of Guelph. We can make life more affordable for everyday people by investing in healthcare, affordable housing, pharmacare. We can build an economy that works better for more people by providing quality, affordable childcare when you need it, making employment insurance work for you, ensuring more accessible job training and lifelong learning for all, supporting small businesses, protecting family budgets, and by forcing big corporations and big polluters to start paying what they owe. We have a detailed plan to combat the climate crisis that will create good jobs in a green economy. And we will undertake the important work of reconciliation in good faith and in true equal partnership with indigenous communities across the country. I understand how important solving these issues are. And I know how important these issues are to the people of Guelph. Thank you. Thank you, Aisha. Next to you, Lloyd Longfield, Liberal Party of Canada. Thank you, Shakiba, and thank you to the Realtors Association as well for sponsoring today's event. 
and for having this important conversation for our community. The last 18 months have been the toughest 18 months that Canada's faced in over a generation, over a hundred years. And we face the challenges together to overcome the, the effects of COVID on our communities from the healthcare to the impacts on families and businesses. And now we're at the point of trying to finish the battle against COVID. We have to address the ongoing fourth wave through vaccination programs that we are already instituting in terms of mandatory vaccinations for federal employees, for people that are traveling on federally re regulated transportation. We have to provide better health care. Something that we found when we were working together in our community was there are a lot of cracks in the health care system. And whether that's the long term care or the support for doctors and nurses on the front line, or working with mental health in our community. That job has to be front and center as we go through the recovery phase of COVID. We're also looking at what does the next economy look like and how do we build that together? How can we address things like systemic racism and getting women back into the workplace through better childcare policy across Canada? having a standard of health care and a standard of child care that's regulated by the federal government working in partnership with the other orders of government. And housing, how do we help young people get into housing? How do we help seniors with housing? We've already been working on affordable housing in Guelph, but the whole continuum of housing is something that really came up as an issue throughout COVID and an issue going forward. And then looking at continuing the work of reconciliation, the ongoing process of truth and reconciliation, facing the truth together and working on solutions with our Indigenous, Métis and Inuit partners. So we have many issues that we have to face, but one common thing is that we have to face them together. That's what helped us get through COVID so far, and that will help us get into the future economy where everybody can participate and have better solutions socially and environmentally for Canada. Thanks, Aisha. Er, th thanks, Shakiva. Thanks, Lloyd. And now to you, Ashish Sachan, Conservative Party of Canada. Ashish, you're muted. Okay, thanks, Shakiba. Okay, uh, so I would like to thank the Guelph Chamber of Commerce and the Guelph and District Association of Realtors for hosting this event. And thank you to those who are joining us. It is a pleasure to be with you here today. My name is Dr. Ashish Sachin, and I have lived in Guelph with my family since 2013. I'm a first generation immigrant, a toxicologist, and most importantly, a very proud Canadian. It speaks uh, volumes of a country to have a first generation immigrant to run as a member of parliament. I'm thankful for the support and the confidence of the people of Guelph as a conservative message continues to resonate in our city. I'm immensely privileged to call myself a Canadian and to be part of its rich traditions and culture. With all this country has afforded to me and my family, I owe a sense of death to this great nation and I seek your support to return my gratitude through civil service and dedicate my efforts to the city I call my home and the community that I consider my family. I believe an elected official must stand up for our country to ensure its economic prowess, protect our institutions, and maintain our standing on the international stage. We must ensure our prime minister acts with integrity and that our government will take care of our veterans and seniors who have helped make this country what it is. Since the 2019 election, we have unfortunately seen a government that continues to place their personal interests before the needs of Canadian citizens. Rather than focusing the elected duties in the ongoing COVID-19 recovery efforts and the humanitarian crisis unfolding in the Middle East, we have gathered here today as the Trudeau government, instead focused their ambition to seek a majority government. 
as more and more Canadians begin to realize our country is heading in the wrong direction, we have an historic opportunity here in our city to make the much needed change to restore integrity and accountability in our nation's capital. On Monday, September 20th, what is full of a choice? A continuation of an irresponsible, mismanaged and scandal plagued government or the opportunity to start anew with a conservative government dedicated to secure the future for our families, our city and our country. With this, I'm happy to be here and thank you again for inviting me to this debate. Thank you, Ashish. Well, we'll begin with our formal questions. Um, I apologize, we are unable to put the timer on the screen as planned. I hope for the candidates, what we're doing for them, which is notifying them at the halfway mark um, is sufficient for now. And certainly we'll, uh, there's grace in that uh, ability to finish thoughts. So um, we'll, we'll keep up with the flexibility here. And if we're able to bring the tech back online, we will do so. And so before we jump into the specific topics and headlines that I identified would be covered, I am hoping that we could take 60 seconds each for you to tell us about why you personally, as a Guelphite, would be the best representative for Guelph in federal parliament. We'd like to get to know you. I will begin with Aisha. Thank you for that question, Shakiba. I believe I would be the best candidate to represent Guelph as your MP in Ottawa because I've lived here my entire life. I've been living all across Guelph and I know the communities well. I'm a registered nurse and my specialty is mental health. I, I understand the difficulties that people experience when it comes to affordability, when it comes to their access to healthcare. When we talk about the climate crisis, it's, it's important to recognize that much needs to be done. And it is the new democratic party that can get ensure that the work does get done and that we're gonna tackle climate crisis to win. I'm committed to our neighborhoods. I'm committed to the families. I am not a career politician, but I am definitely here to continue advocating for my community and to support people, to listen to them, to respond to them. Thank you, Aisha. Thank you. Lloyd, same question to you. Why do you make a good representative at Parliament? Thank you, Shakiba. And it's been a, an honor to serve as Guelph's Member of Parliament uh, over the last six years. When I first started this journey, it was a journey of community service. When I was first asked if I consider to run I thought I've never been involved with politics. I'm not a politician. I come from a business background. I was president of the Chamber of Commerce and working with all the businesses and not-for-profits in Guelph and making connections that way. But really politics wasn't something that I was aspiring to. But putting it into the framework of community service is really what has given me my guidance through the, the times that I've, I've had uh, as a member of parliament. And really in the last year of fighting COVID and drawing on the, the, the experience from the Chamber of Commerce of making connections within the community to work on issues together, to solve problems together is, is something that all of us are aspiring to. And as a member of parliament, I have the opportunity to bring people together to, to address the concerns of the community, whether it's housing or mental health or business or environmental concerns. Thank so you, I love the connections and I'd love to continue to do that. Ashish, why would thank you make you, Thank you, thank you again. Uh, thank you, Aisha. Uh, thank you, uh, Shakiba, for that uh, question here. And um, I just mentioned in my opening remarks that I'm a first generation immigrant and uh, I'm here only for um, eight years and uh, I became a citizen in 2018. And it's such an honor. Um, I think it speaks volumes about this country that I have the opportunity and uh, to run for the highest office in the land, so to say. And, uh, you know, there's the number of ways an immigrant community looks into um, into the way that things are going around in this country at this moment under the, under the current prime minister. I don't think we or I have that level of pride I would like to have for Canada under the current government. And, uh, 
you know, it's, it's one thing to be on the sidelines and complain or rather be on the forefront and face it and try to change something with the change you want to see kind of thing. So I think I'm here, I'm supported by a great party. I'm a member, um, so our party has a great platform. So we just based on jobs, economy, mental health um, and, and the country and to be self-reliant. And I think I want to see our country progress and uh, be an be a, a international leader. Thank you, Ashish. Yeah. Michelle, to you. Thanks, as I mentioned, um, I'm here because of climate policy and because too many people are falling through the cracks. I'm a scientist, so I can see when the policy doesn't match the evidence. For my career, I moved around a lot every six months to a couple of years all over North America until I moved to Guelph. And there was something just really special about Guelph, how everyone's engaged, the community, and I've been here for 10 years. Um, so I feel really lucky to run in a community like Guelph. Again, my decisions and my motives will be based on evidence. Greens have the best policy. We're the first to propose really progressive policies like guaranteed livable income, gay marriage. And this is our time, this is our moment. Also, the Greens is a grassroots movement, so it's not a top-down movement, and I think that's really important. Um, Thank Nadia, you, Michelle. Thanks. Thank you. So I cut a lot of grace for all of you, and that's because we were still trying to figure out our timer. Thank you for those introductions and for telling us about you. It's helpful uh, to the community in Guelph. I wanted to make sure you can all see the timer on your screen. That is the tool we're gonna to continue to use and that way it's fair and everyone can see the time continue to move. And again, I do, I will be a bit stricter. Please do be mindful of, uh, of that time. We wanna make sure we get through all the questions. So we're gonna begin with affordability. And we're gonna start with Lloyd. What is your position on implementing a universal basic income for Canadians? Thanks, Shakiba. The I think we've all seen the the need for additional supports and better supports for people across Canada. Uh, when we introduced the Canada Child Benefit, we saw a huge economic uptake from that. When we introduced the CERB during COVID, we saw what that did to keep communities intact and families together and people paying bills. So we have to look for a way to have a uh, basic income implemented, but we also know that we have to work with our pro provincial partners in order to achieve that as, as a goal. Thank you. And thanks for the timer. Great, thank you, Lloyd. Next is Ashish. What is your position on implementing a universal basic income? Ashish, sorry, you'll have to be mindful of your mute and yeah, unmute yeah, each time. Yeah, okay, I am. Thank you. Thank you. So I have been on the thousands of doors in Guelph and affordability is a huge issue for uh, Guelphites. And uh, we know that every, the price of everything has gone up. The inflation is at the highest rate. Gas prices have gone up. Housing prices are going, houses price, housing prices are going up as well. So our, uh, I think Canadian, Canada's conservatives have the plan, the Canada's recovery plan to make sure that everyone has good jobs, good paying jobs, and um, there's more money in the pockets of Canadians. Thank you, Michelle. Thanks, as I mentioned, the Greens were first to propose, um, advocate for a guaranteed livable income. 10% 10 10 of people in Canada don't live a standard of living enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So we need to mend our social safety net so no one falls through the cracks. We know from research it stimulates the economy. It's one of the calls to action in the missing murdered Indigenous women and girls reports. And it gives people in Canada choice 
and it enables them to live with dignity. And like I said, we've been calling for it for a long time and we definitely would implement it. Thank you. Aisha. While the ultra wealthy made record profits, families across Canada have just gone through one of the most difficult years of their entire lives. People are just looking for a break. We will move towards basic livable income. It's not, um, what we currently have is not working for most Canadians and we need to make a change. It's time to make investments where people need it most. Addressing out of control housing prices, reducing the student debt burden, making prescription drugs available to everyone and investing in good quality jobs all over Canada. Everybody wins when we deliver better public services that all Canadians can rely on. Families know that and so do businesses. Thank you. Move on to the next question and begin with Ashish. The question is, housing has become increasingly unaffordable in Guelph and across the country, a trend that has been exacerbated by the pandemic. Housing supply issues have a fairly significant impact on long-term long housing affordability. What can the federal government do to help with housing supply issues across the country? Uh, thanks, Shoki, for that question. I hear, okay, we are not, um, the way I would like to answer is that we are not building enough homes to keep up with Canada's growing population. Uh, this is a big part of why homes are getting harder and harder for Canadians to afford. And uh, there's uh, a lot of foreign money uh, flowing into Canada's housing market. Um, and uh, Canada's recovery plan, the, which the uh, Canada's conservatives have, will address both these issues and will make homes more affordable for owners as well as the renters. Uh, we will implement uh, to build 1 million more homes in the next three years. And uh, we will review the extensive real estate portfolio of the federal government as well, the largest property owner in our country. And uh, we'll build more homes near the public funded trans uh, transits and we'll ban foreign investors from buying homes here if they're not planning to move to Canada. And uh, we will um, encourage foreign investors to build um, rental housing for Canadians. I think that will um, solve the problem which we are facing currently. Thank you, Ashish. Michelle, question about housing supply and the role of the federal government. Uh, we have kind of a few approaches, one for renters. The first thing we'd like to see is a moratorium on evictions continue during the pandemic. And then after that, rent control and some retroactive rental arrears until we can get the affordability down to a reasonable level. As has already been said, regu regulations to deter predatory practices We'll also invest in housing, but it'll be really targeted. So 50,000 supportive housing units this decade, 300,000 deeply affordable. And these recommendations are consistent with votehousing.ca and other nonpartisan groups. Um, we also have very targeted specific programs for disabled youth and indigenous communities. Thank you. The same question to you, Aisha. Everyone in Canada should have a safe, affordable home. Too many people are struggling to make ends meet every month as housing prices continue to go up. Lloyd, I know you care about the lack of affordable housing in Guelph, but let's look at what your government has actually done about it. I've talked to some of the city council, council members and they have told me that the Liberal program is basically just a subsidy to developers it doesn't do much for renters themselves. Mr. Trudeau is now promising an anti-flipping tax to crack down on property developers who flip homes for quick profit and drive up house prices. It's a good policy and we need the tax, but then the newspapers reveal that the liberal candidate in Vancouver Granville in one of Canada's biggest real estate flippers, he can't even remember how many houses he has flipped but the media reports that he has sold at least 42 properties in Vancouver in the last few years, making millions. Thank Voters you, Asha. Up with the... Thank you. That's your time. Thank you. 
Lloyd, it's your turn. Um, and because you were called specifically out, we will give you an additional minute if you choose to use it. Thank you. Thank you, Shakiba. And, and thank you for framing. I think you framed the question very well, uh, that the supply of housing is really an issue that we have to deal with in Guelph. And working with the realtors and the, the Home Builders Association, they have also identified this as an issue that we have to work on together. We have to fast track the permitting process, working with City Hall. And on our platform, we have a billion dollar fund put in place to help municipalities with e-permitting and ways of reducing red tape so that we can create housing solutions. It's not just about affordable housing, as I said in my, my opening statements, it's the housing continuum that we need a stock of all types of housing to be available to people that want to get into the market. So we need to bridge the gap with the municipalities in terms of the cost of implementing better housing programs. And I look forward to working together with City Hall on that. And with the mayor, we've had some discussions on this already and I know going forward, we need to find those solutions together. And we are working with the Federation of Canadian Municipalities and with the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation, where we have about a dozen projects so far identified in Guelph to put cranes in the air. And it's great, when I was president of the Chamber of Commerce, we hadn't had cranes in the air for a long time. It's great to see them happening now for rental units, for seniors units, and for condos. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Lloyd. So speaking of which, what other actions would your government, other than regarding supply, take to ensure access to affordable housing across the housing continuum in our community? So what other actions? Michelle, we start with you. Thanks. As I mentioned last time, we have um, programs specific to disabled youth and Indigenous communities. Um, some examples for disabled communities are we mandate 30% of housing developments be suitable for the disabled population. Um, with respect to youth, we'd increase funding to shelters and pair those with mental health supports until they can get into affordable housing. Um, with Indigenous communities, the initiatives would be Indigenous-led. So we're there to support the Indigenous communities, but we're not there um, to tell them how they should tackle their housing crisis. Thank you, Aisha. Other than supply, how would the federal government um, ensure access to affordable housing across the continuum? Because the cost of housing or accommodations is really high, which majority of Canadians are suffering from feeling house poor, which means that they're spending more than 30% of their income for housing and utilities. The Liberal government keeps talking about housing, but for Canadians struggling every month to keep up with rising costs, this is urgent. Under Justin Trudeau, Canada's house price to income ratio is the highest in the OECD by large margin. Only a third of Canadians could afford to buy any type of home right now. Under Justin Trudeau, prices of homes has increased by 55%. We've got a plan to invest right now to create half a million units of quality affordable housing across the country. Our plan will create jobs and build the rental cooperative and social housing that is so desperately needed. Thank you. Thank you, Lloyd. Other than supply. Thank you. And <clears throat> There's many, many aspects to solving the housing crisis. Uh, the supply is one piece, but helping people with the financing and the, uh, the sourcing of their, their homes is another part of it. And the two have to work together. One thing that we're looking at is banning bl blind bidding so that when people are buying a house, there's a more transparent process to get to the, the sale price that you, or the purchase price of the home. Having a legal right for home inspection is another area to make sure that similar to buying 
used vehicle, you, you can know what the history is of the property that you're looking at. Ensuring that lenders can defer up to six months if family circumstances change. And then changing mortgage rules so that the reducing the cost of insurance on CMHC mortgages. Thank you, Lloyd. We're gonna to move to the topic of childcare. We have one question and we will begin with Aisha. A Canada-wide early learning and child care system is a critical component of economic recovery and long-term prosperity. Do you agree with this? And if so, how will your government work collaboratively with provinces and territories to ensure this system is put in place across the country? Sorry, I have to uh, pause here for a moment. I may have missed Ashish. Ashish's answer to the last question. I'm sorry, Ashish, let's give you an opportunity before we go to childcare. Okay, uh, let me get back to my- No problem. And let me ask the, you the question again. Sure. What other actions other than related to supply would your government take to ensure access to affordable housing across the housing continuum? Apologies think, all. Uh, yeah, no problem. Uh, thanks, Sakiba. Okay, here, I think uh, one other, sub other than supply, I think we have to look into the mortgages aspect of it. We have to make sure that mortgages are more affordable. Uh, and uh, in that regard, uh, the conservative plan will encourage new markets in seven to 10 year mortgages to provide stability for the, both the first time home buyers and lenders. And, um, and also we'll remove the requirement to conduct a stress test when a homeowner renews a mortgage with the same, uh, with another lender. And we have to, we have to also address uh, homelessness and uh, to address homelessness, uh, Canada's conservatives will re-implement the housing first approach, which has been watered down by current federal government. And um, also we will revise the federal government substance abuse policy framework to make recovery its overarching act. And um, also we have to address the indigenous housing issue and Canada's conservatives will continue the conservative commitment to reconciliation with Canada's indigenous uh, people by enacting a for indigenous and by indigenous strategy. Thank you, Ashish. Think, yeah. Lloyd, one minute for rebuttal. Thank you. It was mentioned the, uh, the Liberal government's policy on housing. And just to underscore that it's a $72 billion uh, commitment over 10 years to improve housing across the continuum of housing. Part of that is the, the uh, rapid access uh, funding for, for housing. We have a few projects in Guelph that have applied in for that, which is a co-investment fund with developers to stimulate and increase the speed of having housing developments in our community for affordable housing. I look forward to the $2.7 billion that's being topped up into that fund so we can get a few of these projects across the line. Thanks, Shagiba. Thanks, Lloyd. So apologies, we'll now move to the child care question beginning with Aisha and I'll repeat it. A Canada-wide early learning and child care system is a critical component of economic recovery and long-term prosperity. Do you agree with this? And if so, how will your government work collaboratively with provinces and territories to ensure this system is put in place across the country? Thank you for an uh, excellent question. I can share with you that for a short period of time when my daughter was four years old, I had moved to Montreal and I was very fortunate for their subsidized childcare service available and I only had to pay $10 a day for exceptional childcare. Parents are stressed and struggling to find quality childcare spots close to home that won't break the bank. Childcare costs in Canada are among the highest in the world. The Liberals have been promising universal childcare for decades and they should have taken care of Canadian families a long time ago. Childcare, in fact, is the most smartest investment we can make in our future and our economy. New Democrats will ensure high quality, affordable childcare is available for all Canadians. Affordable childcare means not having to choose between having a family and having a career, being able to save for child's education or our own retirement. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Aisha. Lloyd. Thanks, Shakiba. And I'm so excited to see that this is in the platform and in fact has been implemented in eight provinces and territories already. I look forward to Ontario getting on board with the other provinces and territories that are moving towards $10 a day childcare. 
within the next four years, going to 50% reduction in childcare costs immediately. So the funding is there. It's a $30 billion fund. It's a by application through the provinces and territories. And that's going to free up money for families to spend on the economy or on housing and other things other than on childcare. And I have a, a group in Guelph that we've already pulled together of experts that are going to help with the implementation of, of early learning child and, and childcare in our community. Ashish. Uh, thanks, Shakibu, for that question again here. Okay, and the conservatives, uh, when it comes to childcare, uh, will put parents back in the driver's seat. I think it's uh, because um, parents know best what their children need and what the family need. And um, when it comes to making the best choices for the children, I think the parents, we have to put parents on the forefront. And uh, we'll put, put forward a proven, proven plan that will address childcare needs for all Canadian families. The conservative child care, uh, child care plan will also enable more women to choose to participate in the workforce. Uh, the conservative plan will provide direct benefits to parents so that they can make the best choice for their own families. In contrast, uh, Trudeau's plan is an extensive outreach of Ottawa knows best approach. The Liberals have made uh, child care promises in eight previous elections since 1993 and have consistently broken every one of them. Hmm. Lloyd, rebuttal. Thank you, Aisha. Uh, thank you, Shakiba. I'm sorry. Aisha had mentioned and, and, and uh, Ashish had also mentioned the Liberal uh, failure to get across the line on child care. And just to point out that the Paul Martin government was going to go ahead until the NDP and the Conservatives voted down the government so that it wasn't implemented. And then we had 10 years of Stephen Harper not implementing childcare. So we're now moving forward with provinces in consultation with, with Indigenous communities as well to have an effective childcare program that will work for each province and territory as well as our Indigenous partners. Thank you. Michelle. Thanks, yes. Another really important issue that came to light during the COVID pandemic, a lot of my colleagues at the university were really strained. Um, young mothers trying to be professors teaching online, so a huge, huge gap in our social safety net. Um, the Greens went through kind of all the evidence and we didn't feel we had enough to nail down some specifics, but we did benchmark 1% of GDP for funding. And then we'd go through a consultation process with all the stakeholders um, to try to find the best path forward. We'd extend parental leave to elder care and miscarriages and also have culturally appropriate spots for First Nations, Inuit and Métis. Thanks, Michelle. Aisha, I see your hand up for rebuttal. I'm just lowering my hand. Thank you very much. You know, um, Lloyd, it was nice for you to mention and remind everyone of 10 years of Harper, but I'm gonna remind you and everyone else that we would had six years of Trudeau. Childcare is long overdue. And when we talk about supporting families, when we talk about thriving communities and the ability for women to equally be in the workforce, we must have childcare and we need childcare now. Thank you. Thank you. We're gonna move forward with a couple of questions regarding truth and reconciliation. We will begin with Lloyd. Canadians are horrified by the discovery of unmarked graves of children at residential schools across Canada. With inquiries in progress and the recommendations of the TRC only starting to be realized, much more work is required. How does your party plan to implement the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission? Lloyd. Thank you, Shakib. And unfortunately, only having 60 seconds, but to, to get, get to the highlights of creating a Center for Truth and Reconciliation, a physical location that we will be staffed to deal with the remaining issues around the, 
the calls to action. 80% of the calls to action are either partially or fully implemented, but we know there's more work to do. And we were all outraged by seeing the discovery of the young people's bodies at the schoolyards, um, places where they should have been in care, and instead they ended up in graves. So we need to deal with the truth part of that and now move forward on reconciliation through the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and working with the communities involved to do what they need to do in order to, to come to reconciliation. Ashish. Ashish, you're muted. The, the Canada's uh, Conservatives do acknowledge the deep sorrow and mourning uh, that all Indigenous people and survivors of residential schools are experiencing. Our hearts grieve for the Indigenous com communities who are sharing in this uh, trauma. Uh, the Conservative Party supports treaty rights and the process of reconciliation with the Canada's Indigenous people. Uh, the Conservative Party also created a Truth and Reconciliation Commission as part of the 2007 Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement which recognized that the Indian residential school system uh, had a profoundly lasting and damaging impact on indigenous culture, heritage, and language. Okay, we, um, we need to do the hard work of tackling issues that will improve the lives of indigenous people across Canada, that include providing First Nations people with clean drinking water and end boiled water advisories on risk. Thank you, Ashish. Yeah. Michelle. Yeah, I just like to make a little bit of a correction that these weren't discoveries that were made, they were confirmations. So for anyone that was listening, Indigenous peoples have been telling us for a long time that this happened. So I'd like to call it confirmation and not discovery. Um, again, the Greens were the first to call for all calls to action in the truth and reconciliation to be realized as soon as possible. As she said, one close to my heart is water. And another thing to recognize is that the residential schools have been replaced by foster care. So it isn't something that happened in the past. It's something that's still happening now. And it's a little less barbaric, but Indigenous children are still being taken from their parents and we really need to address that. So those are a couple of the recommendations close to my heart. Thank you, Aisha. Um, a few years ago, I had an opportunity participating in, a, in the blanket exercise by Kairos. That experience helped me understand and personally commit to truth and reconciliation. It is actually every Canadian's responsibility to commit to the truth and reconciliation. Justin Trudeau and the Liberals talk about reconciliation and promises to respect Indigenous rights, but instead spends millions of dollars fighting First, Nation kid, First Nations kids in court. Jagmeet Singh and the NDP are committed to true nation-to-nation -nation relationship, reconciliation, recognition of Indigenous rights, and equal funding. Under our plan, we will commit to safe housing, clean drinking water now, respectful, safe access to healthcare, ending the underfunding of Indigenous children's services. Thank you. Lloyd for rebuttal. Thank you, Shakiba. And just to, to correct the record that our government did implement a new act to support Indigenous children, families, and youth. It's the act representing Indigenous Métis and Inuit children, families, and youth that was passed in January 2020. And it was co-signed on the protocol by the AFN on the 7th of July, 2020. We're working with Indigenous communities to have childcare where it needs to be with Indigenous families. And that was a huge step forward, which is now going through the distinction-based implementation so that we can come to the right solution for each Indigenous community to keep their children where they need to be. Plus, we've invested in schools on reserve so that they can go to school on reserve and not be shipped away from their families so they can have culturally approach, appropriate education in their language. Thank you. The next question regarding truth and reconciliation as a topic will begin with Ashish. Despite being one of 
the most water rich nations in the world, Canada has been unable to guarantee access to clean water to all Indigenous peoples. How do you plan to accelerate access to resources like clean drinking water to these communities? I think we have to take a holistic, we have to take a holistic approach in this regard. And you're very right, Shakiba, that we are a G7 country. We are in we are 2021, and we don't have clean drinking water for our fellow Canadians. And uh, so there are a lot of uh, problems. And um, as Aisha did mention, that last six years we have not made any progress under the Trudeau government. Uh, so um, we have to move ahead and um, we have to have a holistic approach. We have to provide economic opportunities or support for education to, for more indigenous uh, people. And uh, we have to provide uh, indigenous businesses better access to government procurement opportunities. And, uh, and human, uh, well, we have to also approach this, you know, like uh, provide mental health support to indigenous communi communities. So there's a lot of issues which we have to uh, tackle uh, in 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 uh, with the uh, there are a lot of issues issues that are tackled with the indigenous community, and um, hopefully we can um, at least end this clean drinking uh, and this uh, boiled water advisory for uh, on the reserves. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah, I, I mean we know how to get water to communities. If there was a community in Guelph that didn't have water, it would probably be fixed by the end of the day, the end of the week at the latest. So it just needs to be a priority. Even if we did get water to the reserves, to remote indigenous communities, their, our housing, their housing is in disrepair, whether it's in urban, rural, or remote areas. So the water still might be contaminated through the pipes in the houses. There's the huge grassy narrows issue of contaminated water in the environment that hasn't been cleaned up, that's long overdue. I mean, we know how to get water to communities. It needs to be a priority. There are other remote communities with water. Aisha. This is a very, very important discussion and ensuring that indigenous people have clean drinking water on their reserves is extremely important. In fact, um, we had ha um, held a town hall meeting with Nikki Ashton talking about the need and the importance of safe drinking water in Indigenous communities. You know, Justin Trudeau promised clean drinking water but only delivered more delays. Trudeau moved the deadline for lifting all drinking water advisories to 2026 a full 11 years after he just promised it. One in five First Nations children living on the reserve live in inadequate and overcrowding housing. Clean drinking water, ensuring safety and access to healthcare services and safe housing is extremely important to, to us. Lloyd, and an additional minute if you so require it. Thanks, Shakiba. And, and this issue is, is something I think Canadians all relate to. We, we know that the situation of having access to clean water is a fundamental human right. I was at the Bay of Quinte, the Mohawks uh, nation, uh, where there were five boiled water advisories within, a, within 100 kilometers of the 401. The issue there wasn't the... the uh, the new water treatment plant, it was the piping to the community. So as we get into solving the problems, then we have to get into the piping. Up in Northern Ontario, we had to get into the solution of, of training water operators and then getting them adequate pay, which is in our platform. Because water operators that get trained then can get scooped by the local paper mills and make more money. So instead trying to keep them within their communities. When we were elected in 2015, there were 103 boiled water advisories. We've eliminated 109 boiled water advisories. The increase in boiled water advisories is because of more stringent water standards, as well as the, the need for us to stop polluting our clean water. So as we move forward, we're creating the Canada Clean Water Agency that will also be working in consultation and membership of Indigenous communities to be on the board. An elder in, in Sulacote, Ontario said to me, 
stop poking holes in Mother Earth and we won't have dirty water. He, he really summed it up for me. We have to first of all, make sure the water is clean in the first place. And then we have to provide the support for the large infrastructure for piping for the training of operators and for the operating and maintenance so that they can buy filters. Some communities have the facilities, but no budget for filters. So that's all being changed since 2015. Very complex and thanks for the extra time. Thank you. We're gonna move on to the topic of healthcare. The first question will begin with Michelle. Prior to the pandemic, Canada was facing a staffing shortage in hospitals and long-term care homes. This has now become its own crisis. How will your party address this? Okay. The crisis in long-term care homes, um, as some of you might know, is really close to our leader's heart, her father, um, passed away during COVID, not from COVID, but from neglect because he wasn't getting adequate care. So we'd like to bring long-term care into the Health Act um, to be part of our health system. We'd like to have minimum care times. Right now, I think workers have about five minutes per client, which is just completely unacceptable. Also, there are some of the lowest paid workers and they didn't want to risk their lives for that low pay to go into seniors homes. So those are some of the issues that we need to tackle. Thank you. Aisha. I'm a registered nurse and I've been nursing now for 23 years. And I have seen over the years the cuts in healthcare and how it hurts people. Healthcare is administered by the provinces, but the rules are set federally and most of the money comes from Ottawa. Every Canadian government boasts that it is spending more money than ever before on healthcare funding transfers to the provinces. More dollars, maybe, but the increases don't even keep up with population growth or inflation, let alone with the cost of breakthrough medical technologies like cancer immunotherapy. Canadians know that our healthcare system was stretched almost to the limit even before the pandemic. Funding has not kept pace with the medical needs. Prime Minister Harper slashed the rate of funding increases to the provinces from 6% to 3%. And what did Justin Trudeau do? Nothing. He kept the rate at 3%. No wonder why we aren't prepared to challenge the pandemic. Canadians are ready Thank for you. better. Thank you, Aisha. Lloyd. Thanks, Shakiba. Something that really came forward during COVID in the early months was the crisis in long-term care. And it was the, actually the Canadian Armed Forces that gave the first report to Parliament on how serious the situation was. But most families already knew how serious it was. The Liberal government stepped in and gave a one-time top-up for personal support workers, Band-Aid solution needed at the time. In our platform, We've got a commitment to hire 50,000 personal support workers and top up funding so they can make $25 an hour so they can be on site to help our seniors that are in long term care, whether it's for profit or not for profit. All seniors deserve access to the same standard of care across Canada. And that's a commitment that we're making in our platform and in our budget and in our actions. Thank you, Ashish. Yeah, regarding the health transfers, uh, under you know, tool that government, can Canadians will be able to count on stable and uh, pre predictable health and social funding pro uh, programs. Uh, it is critical for Canadians to have a confidence that these programs will be there for them when they need them. And, um, and under the Justin Trudeau, out of control spending is putting healthcare funding at risk and uh, he will be forced to raise taxes or cut funding to important social services like healthcare. Uh, if the current uh, spending is not brought under control in a responsible fashion. I expected your hand to go up. Lloyd. Thank you. There is one item that I didn't mention, and thanks to the other candidates for allowing me some extra time, and that's on inspections. And as we looked at COVID, the inspections that weren't performed by the province was a real issue. So there's funding in our, in our, in our platform and in our upcoming budgets 
to include inspections and speaking with the long-term care facilities. And I've spoken to all of them throughout COVID. That was one of the critical areas. And also the inspectors coming in and working together, not coming in with punitive measures, but coming in and saying, here's the standard. Here's where you're not meeting the standard. Let's work together to get you up to standard instead of slapping them with fines. Thank you. The next question will begin with Aisha. We cannot disregard the secondary effects of the pandemic. How will your party address the growing substance abuse and mental health challenges communities are facing? It is troubling to see the increase of opioid drug overdoses, these accidental deaths, the drug poisoning out in our streets, the lack of access to mental health care from children to adults, and something needs to be done. And what we need is commitment and courage to strengthen our Medicare system that will include mental health services. This means, you know, mental health services in the community and also in hospitals. We need addiction treatment. We need recovery treatment. We need to support people. This is an illness. It's not about a morale issue. And people need to be supported. It will save lives. I'm telling you, with increasing our social supports, we can save people. Thank you. Thank you, Lloyd. Thank you. And thank you for bringing this very important topic. And thank you for the work of the chamber in downtown Guelph, looking at this as an issue that we need to work on together. Uh, one of the tables that I, I sit at, in fact, I convene, has to do with mental health in our community. And one of the areas of mental health that goes into the opioid crisis is the adverse childhood effects and working with the mental health professionals to help people that are self-medicating that results in opioid deaths. Working with the Community Health Center in downtown Guelph, we've been able to provide them new funding of $1.1 million dollars to address the opioids crisis in our community. And then working with partners like the Chamber and other, our other partners to bring people to a better place, including housing, including nutritious food, and including the social supports that they need to get through the crisis that they're facing in their personal lives. Ashish. Yeah, okay. Um, see, mental health is one of the five pillars of uh, Canada's recovery plan, and uh, we know how important this is uh, for our country and for all Canadians. Uh, this pandemic has really deepened Canada's mental health crisis, uh, especially for youth. It is estimated that one in five Canadians have suffered from depression, anxiety, or post-traumatic stress, stress disorder. And uh, Canada's Conservatives will address the mental health issues by recognizing that mental health is health and will make historic investments to help those in need. Uh, with the Mental Health Action Plan, Canada's Conservatives will uh, massively boost health transfers to provinces by at least 6% annually, doubling the Liberal commitment and uh, the commitment and representing nearly $60 billion more of health care over the next 10 years. Uh, we'll, work with the, we'll work with the provinces to invest in mental health as a priority, and we will encourage employers to add mental health coverage to the employee benefit plans. Thank you, Ashish. Okay. Michelle. As Ashish mentioned, one in five Canadians suffer from mental health and their mental health issues in their lifetime. Um, recent estimates have suggested that the costs of those tragedies are about $50 billion a year in costs associated with mental health issues. So it just makes common sense instead of paying for them after to pay for them up front and then we can decrease the suffering. With respect to the opioid crisis, we consider them poisonings, not overdoses because of the chemicals involved. And we would like them to be, again, seen as a healthcare issue, not a criminal issue. So we need to decriminalize, destigmatize if we're going to solve the problem. Thank you. The next question will begin with Lloyd. Proof of vaccination and rapid screening programs are being adopted both by government and business to allow for safe employment, 
to increase consumer confidence and safety? Do you support a national proof of vaccination program? Why or why not? I, I think we need to get to the point where everyone in Canada has to show the proof of vaccination in order to reduce the, uh, the impact on community. Proof of vaccination mostly is administered by the provinces, which is why we've put a $1 billion fund into place to help the provinces and territories with the implementation of proof of vaccination. We need to do this to protect our kids, the people that are under 12 years old that don't have access to, to vaccination services until approvals come in and our, our public health units watching that every day. So as soon as the approval gets, gets in place, they'll put, it, they'll put the vaccinations in place for our kids and also for our, our healthcare workers. So we need to protect each other as a community and uh, proof of vaccination is a great way of us doing that. Ashish. Yeah, okay. Okay, uh, regarding the proof of vaccination, okay, uh, we, we believe that as a conservative party believes the Canadians have the right to make their own health choices. That being said, uh, as a country, we must never be uh, caught unprepared as we were when COVID hit last year. And uh, Canada's conservatives will make Canada more resilient, reduce the reliance on foreign countries like China, and uh, take seriously a responsibility to protect the health of Canadians. Also, uh, vaccines are the most important tool to fight against COVID-19. We encourage every Canadian who is able to get one should get one. Our expectation is that anyone campaigning in a party, like we are going door to door, um, we have done thousands of doors in Guelph, who isn't vaccinated passes the daily rapid test and the uh, Conservative Party will follow all public health measures and in all local campaigns in, in, that, in that regard. And again, uh, I think the point to be, the important point is that Canadians have the right to make their own health choices. Thank you. Michelle. Uh, federal proof of vaccination has always been a requirement to travel to different countries. Also, provincially, it's always been a requirement to go to public schools. Um, but I do sympathize with people that are uncomfortable with the science. And I think we need to address mistrust of science and why that's occurring. Do we need more education, better communication? Are there reasons that people don't trust science? So this is important for this issue, but across issues, across climate change, biodiversity crises. So we really have to take a good look and ask why people mistrust science, mistrust government, and build that trust back. Thank you. Aisha. I'm a registered nurse and I've worked full time during this pandemic in the front lines. I can tell you that working in Hamilton, it was a hot spot during the pandemic. And for the safety of my family and the safety of my community, I made the choice to not come back to Guelph until I was fully vaccinated. We firmly believe and support mandatory federal vaccine, vaccination for people that are going to be having direct care and or are in a position that are going to be delivering care or um, so this includes healthcare professionals and teachers. Um, it's about public safety. It's about this is all that we have really aside from masking and physical distance, social distancing in order to protect each other from this virus. Thank you. Thank you. We're now going to move on to the topic of the economy and post-pandemic recovery. The first question will be posed uh, to, um, and we'll begin with Ashish. Canadians benefited from the cross-party commitment and collaboration on doing whatever was needed to address the acute needs of the pandemic. This, was, this has, however, created an unprecedented deficit. What is your party's plan moving forward to work towards a balanced budget? Ashish, you're muted. Okay, the jobs and economy uh, are one of the uh, biggest uh, uh, pillars of our conservative plan has. 
And uh, over the course of the pandemic, millions of Canadians have lost their jobs, uh, with women accounting for more than half of over uh, year over year employment losses. The tourism and the hospita hospitality sectors were among the hardest hit. We were, uh, as well as some uh, part time and temporary workers. Uh, to get our economy back on track, Canada's recovery plan will recover a million jobs lost in the sectors hardest hit by the pandemic and uh, get as many people back to work uh, in good jobs in every part of Canada, in every sector, as quickly as possible. Uh, one of uh, Once the Canada's uh, emergency uh, wage subsidy ends, Canada's Conservatives will introduce uh, the Canada's job search plan to get Canadians back to work. An O'Toole government will pay at least 25% of the salary of the new hires for six months after Thank CEWS you. expires. Ashish. Michelle, to you, how will your government work towards a balanced budget? Yeah, the Greens were really excited last election to put forward a carefully costed program that would balance the budget. And obviously that's going to be tougher to do now with this huge um, debt that we've run up. Again, I'd like to stress that Greens are proactive. So we would like to think we would have prevented or at least minimize the impacts of the pandemic. When people talk about social programs, they think of costs, but when the Greens think of social problem, social programs, they think of savings. So we could hu save huge amounts on pharmacare. Pandemics are expensive. Climate change is expensive. Poverty, homelessness, and as I said, poor mental health are expensive. So we have to look for those cost savings. Thank you. Aisha. Trudeau is giving his rich friends a free ride when we need them to pitch in and do their fair share. Canadians have sacrificed enough and shouldn't have to pay for the recovery. Instead, billionaires and corporations that profited from the pandemic should have to pay. The wealth of Canada's billionaires has increased by $78 billion since March 2020, while 5.5 million Canadian workers lost their jobs or had more than half of their hours cut at the pandemic's peak. We need to make a, our tax system fair and invest in services people need by ensuring the ultra-rich and corporations pay their fair share, getting rid of tax loopholes for the richest and big corporations, and getting tough on tax evasions and tax avoidance. It's about priorities. To you, Lloyd. Thanks, Shakiba. I think I'm thinking back to April 2020 when the Prime Minister said, We're going to have your back for as long as it takes. And we have had Canadians back all the way through the pandemic and through the different waves of pandemic, and now going into the fourth wave. So now isn't the time for us to say, Okay, now we're going to start cutting costs and we're not going to have your back anymore. We need to continue to support Canadians through the recovery of COVID. On our platform, we have a five-year costed budget for everything that we're talking about doing. Standard and Poor's and Moody's have both given us AAA credit ratings. Our debt to GDP is lower than most countries in the G7. So we are within our means to invest in Canadians, and we're going to continue to do just that. Thank you. The next question will begin with Michelle about interprovincial trade. So we know that interprovincial trade and commerce remain a key challenge in Canada. For example, it's easier to buy a bottle of California wine in Ontario than it is to buy a bottle of British Columbian wine. How does your party propose to address this issue? Michelle. Yeah, I was actually really shocked when I read part of the platform that Canadians, how much Canadians import that they could grow at home. So it's not bananas, coffee, the things you would think we would import. Um, so the Greens are committed to increasing what we produce in Canada by 30%. Because um, it just doesn't make sense that strawberries from Ontario cost more than strawberries from California. So we have to look at the reasons behind why that's happening. Um, and 
Yeah, it, it definitely should be easier within provinces and between provinces than between countries. Things coming, now we're having milk imported from the US that we can clearly um, produce in Canada. So we need to, to put a magnifying glass on that and fix those problems. Aisha. Thank you. What we would like to do is remove any of those barriers that come in between when we talk about interprovincial trade, we want to build self-reliance, and then we also want to promote um, interprovincial trade. Thank you. Lloyd. I'm using the word together a lot. We need to work together with provinces and territories to eliminate the barriers to trade. Some of those are regulatory barriers. So different provinces have different regulations of what's sold in their province. Some of them are protecting the different lobby groups that are within the provinces. And Shakiba, when I was president of the chamber, we were talking about it then, and we're still talking about how do we get the federal government to work with the provinces and territories to increase Canadian supply chain. We saw during COVID how we pivoted to Canadian supply chain for PPE and what that did for our economy. 92% of our jobs have been recovered that we lost during COVID compared to the United States recovery of 75%. So we know when we buy Canadian, it's good for all Canadians. We need to address that with provinces and territories and get those barriers out of the way. Thank you. Ashish. Yeah, uh, thanks Shakiba for the question. I did have a town hall with uh, Member of Parliament, Dan Elvis. And he did interestingly mention that it is easier to ship wine uh, from British Columbia to Tokyo than to Ontario. And uh, so yes, interprovincial trade is something uh, we have the, the federal government, uh, the Conservative Party will look into. And uh, I think we have to work with the provinces um, uh, uh, to make that thing happen. And it is uh, something uh, which I have uh, washed the limits and create barriers towards uh, I think if we remove interprovincial trade barriers, it will lead to a more productive economy. At the same time, we also must respect the safety net implemented by provinces and to protect the local industries. Thank you. The next question will be posed first to Aisha. The Canadian tax system was last overhauled in 1966. Is it time for a Royal Commission on Taxation to create a more efficient system, especially for small business, to encourage job creation and innovation and to simplify the system for all Canadians? How does your party propose to address the complexity of the Canadian tax system? Aisha, to you. Trudeau talks a good talk, but he voted against a 1% on wealth tax over 20 million and refused to tax companies that have profited during the pandemic. He stood by while grocery chains made profits and clawed back pandemic pay from frontline workers. O'Toole, a Bay Street lawyer with a long history of fighting for the wealthiest corporations in Canada's elite, voted against the wealth tax. Our solution. We need to make our tax system fair and invest in services people need by. Ensuring the ultra rich and corporations pay their fair share, getting rid of tax loopholes for the richest and big corporations and getting tough on tax evasions and tax avoidance. Thank you. Thank you, Lloyd. Thank you to the, to the Guelph Chamber and the Canadian Chamber of Commerce for continuing to advocate for simplifying our tax laws in Canada. Uh, we have built a, built a layer upon layer upon layer system of taxation that has to be simplified. Uh, we've had a conversation offline over the, over the last few years, uh, Shakiba, with your members about this. And uh, I think that a Royal Commission is one approach. Another approach could be working with the Senate. Uh, this is a multi-year study that has to be done. And when we're dealing with four-year or two-year parliamentary schedules, it's too big a job for, in terms of the amount of time it's going to take to correct for this to go through 
the House of Commons part of Parliament, I think the Senate would be a great place to initiate studies on simplifying Canada's tax laws. So when you change one piece, you don't you have to follow all the way through to see what that what the impact is on all pieces. Thank you, Lloyd. Ashish. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Shakiba, for that question again. And uh, the the Canada's conservatives will really work towards a more responsive uh, the Canada, Canada Revenue Agency. And uh, conservatives will ensure that the CRA is responsible, responsive to the needs of Canadians and delivers uh, quality services and advice, respects small businesses and focuses uh, its efforts on wealthy tax um, evaders and big corporations. And uh, in that regard, Canada's conservatives will make the taxpayer uh, ombudsman officer of parliament with order making authority and um, we'll also impose uh, a duty of care, a legal obligation to a reasonable standard on CRA. Uh, we'll also create a welcome to CRA program and materials for small businesses and allow businesses with less than $60,000 in revenue to use simple cash accounting. I think that would be the answer uh, to your question, Shakiba, here for me. Thank you. Lloyd Rebuttal, and we'll try and keep rebuttals um, a little bit shorter just so we can keep yeah, on time today. I, I, I appreciate that you're giving me time and I don't want to overdo it, but the Liberal Party and, and, and uh, Prime Minister keep getting mentioned. The tax fairness is something we can work on right away and are working on right away. And taxing the ultra, we're ultra wealthy, the top 1%, something we did very early in our mandate. And we are working on tax fairness. But in terms of the complexity of the Canada Tax Act, which is what you were mentioning, that's a big job that needs to be done over many years. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah, I have a huge kind of long laundry list, but we've been advocating for a while for an arm's length federal tax commission. And it's like Lloyd said, it will take a while. Um, advocate for empty home tax, luxury tax, Make sure that CRA focuses on offshore tax havens and not targeting average Canadians. Again, we were disappointed um, that the 1% tax on the wealth above 20 million didn't go through. That's really low. Um, things like taxing Netflix, Facebook that aren't paying their fair share, um, putting a transaction tax of 0.5% on the financial sector, increasing the corporate tax rate from 15 to 21, and I have to get my favorite in, eliminating all fossil fuel subsidies. Thank you. Okay, the next question, we'll start with Lloyd. There are currently 800,000 unfilled positions in Canada. We hear a lot about job creation, but how will your party address the current labor shortage? Locally, we're working with Second Chance Employment uh, that have just received over a million dollars to help vulnerable people get into employment, to help fill some of those jobs locally. We know it's a national issue and will continue to be a national issue as the retirement wave comes in. And now we've got a COVID retirement wave that's hitting us. So we need to increase immigration. We need to improve the uh, recognition of international credentials, mobility of labor across Canada is an issue that we're working on with the provinces and territories. And then locally, we're funding the, the local IBEW for creating more apprenticeships for electricians in our area. We've, get, we've, we've created uh, $5.6 million in funding for Conestoga College to manage more positions for skilled trades development. So working together with the chamber, of course. Thanks, Lloyd Ashish. Yeah, I think uh, in that regard, uh, we have, uh, regarding that, one of the bigger biggest pillars we have uh, is about job creation. And um, the number of uh, points there, but I'll focus on rebuilding a main streets here. Uh, so Canada's conservatives will help build main streets across Canada and give small businesses the support they need to get back on their feet we will launch the Rebuild Main Street tax credit that will provide 25% tax credits on amounts of up to $100,000. And we will also launch the Main Street business loans to provide loans up to $200,000. Uh, 
the Canada's Investment Accelerator Refundable Tax Credit for Small Business will provide a 5% investment tax credit for any capital investments made in 2020, 2022 and 2023. Uh, Canada's uh, Conservatives will also reform the Business Development uh, Bank of Canada to ensure that its loan programs are accessible to small businesses. Thank you. Michelle. Hey, sorry, could I ask you to repeat the question? Yes. So we have over 800,000 unfilled positions in Canada. We hear a lot about job creation, but how will your party address the current labor shortage? Yeah, I think the problem isn't a labor shortage, but it's a wage shortage. Um, so I think guaranteed livable income will help. People will have options. They won't have to work at jobs that don't pay the rent, that don't put food on the table. Um, so all the, the holes in the social safety net will help. So if you don't have to pay for healthcare, if you don't have to pay, sorry, for pharmacare, for childcare, that will make it a more affordable and you won't need as much money to live. And you'll be able to work for wages, but definitely, we want to increase the student wage to match the minimum wage. And again, I would say it's not a labor shortage, but a low wage problem. Thank you, Aisha. We've got real solutions to create jobs and make life better for workers across the country. Too many families are worried about making ends meet and need action to create jobs and make life easier. Instead of supporting workers or creating jobs, Justin Trudeau is cutting supports for Canadians who are looking for work while the pandemic is entering its fourth wave. We have a plan to create over 1 million additional good new jobs, building up our communities with investments in affordable and energy efficient housing, transportation, and energy infrastructure. Making products that people want and need here, including critical PPE, vaccines, zero emission cars, and clean tech building better workplaces for all workers with paid sick leave, pharmacare and dental care, a higher minimum wage and an expanded training opportunities. Thank you. Thank you. We wanna dive a little deeper into skilled trades. Acquiring and retaining skilled talent was a challenge leading into the pandemic and more than ever, ever skilled trades shortages continue to grow across the country. Current efforts at addressing this issue uh, do not seem to be making a large enough impact. What are your party's plans to accelerate and coordinate current efforts to address these specific shortages? Begin with Ashish. Ash Ashish, you're muted. Okay, I think in this regard, we have to make sure that we have job, job training for workers and uh, our party will ensure that workers have the training they need for the jobs of today and tomorrow by supporting training programs run by unions and other groups and uh, encouraging employers to invest in their workers. Uh, we will also bring uh, uh, women and new Canadians into the skilled trades. We will uh, double the apprentice job uh, creation tax credit for the next three years to help create more uh, uh, places for such uh, job trainings. And, um, and we'll also help the tourism and hospitality workers who have been hit hard by the recession. Michelle. Um, Greens advocate for free post-secondary education and that definitely includes skilled trades. So we're hoping that if the programs are free that more people will sign up um, also things like co-op programs um, and small, helping small businesses as well. So it's more attractive to set up a skills trade small business. Um, but I think the education piece is big um, because it's expensive. It takes a long time um, to be mentored to acquire the skills that you need to start your own small trades business. So we're really hoping that would help with that particular shortage. Thank you, Aisha. I was fortunate enough that um, I was educating students 
um, anatomy and physiology through the college um, during a, um, a dual credit course. And it was, it was, it was started because there were hopes that these students would carry on after high school and, post, and pursue their post-secondary education. But what I learned was that many of these people or many of these students, bright students, had opted not to go to college or university because they couldn't afford it. This is an affordability issue. This is about a government that needs to support our future. We're going to be creating more opportunities. We're going to be um, doubling up our grants, federal grants for, for students. We're gonna be removing um, the interest in student debt. These are difficult times for students. And what they need is more reassurance that there is a promising future for them. Thank you. Thank you. Lloyd? This is a supply and demand uh, problem similar to housing where you have to work on both the supply and on the demand. And what I mean by that is we need to help employers to hire skilled tradespeople as they're coming out of COVID. And we've got the workers benefit and the, uh, the investment uh, uh, support for businesses to hire people with skilled trades. We're introducing uh, the programs for the uh, accreditation of, of international uh, certificates, as well as working with the College of Trades across Canada so we have better labor standards uh, coordinated between jurisdictions so people have better mobility uh, across the country on skilled trades. So we need to work on both together and we also have to work on that with the provinces and territories where this issue sits. Thank you. The next question, we'll, we'll start with Michelle. Businesses in many sectors like tourism and hospitality are negatively impacted and still struggling because of the pandemic and pandemic related public health measures. Programs like the wage subsidy and rent subsidy were essential to keeping these businesses operational. How do you propose to continue to support the hardest hit sectors and for how long? What more needs to be done? Michelle. Hey, thanks for that question. Yeah, as you mentioned, um, the wage and rent subsidies were key and we would extend those until COVID is also hold the small business tax rate at 9%, um, reduce lots of the paperwork and bureaucracy that kind of ties down small businesses. Um, but I think the most exciting part of the plan is a green venture capital fund of $1 billion. So as I mentioned at the beginning, and I haven't had a lot of time to talk about is that we want to promote this green future. There's huge, huge opportunities in the green economy. The Europeans are capitalizing on them and Canada is being left behind and we really need to take this opportunity. Thank you, Aisha. Many people and small businesses and tourism most definitely have suffered because of the pandemic. Um, we will continue to support Canadians for as long as we need to. We're still in the midst of the pandemic. It's not over anytime soon. And the new, Demo new Democrats in the House have proven that we continue to fight for Canadians. Examples such as CERB, which was first introduced as being $1,000. We continue to fight for Canadians and, and fought for something that was much more reasonable and realistic, which is $2,000. We talked about an increased CEWS to 75% to support um, workers and prevent them from losing their jobs. We have a proven track record to always fight for people and we will continue to do so. That is our commitment. Lloyd. We know that the tourism and hospitality industry was the first hit by COVID and will be the last to recover as people aren't booking the events at their places. People aren't traveling across Canada yet. Uh, international travel is just starting. So we're in our platform, we have an extension of the rent and, and wage subsidies for tourism industry of 75% that will go into 2022. 
knowing that they're not going to see their customers back until next next major tourism season in the summer of 2022. I'm working locally with the tourism operators, with the hotel industry, and we're doing it on a case by case, but as a broad statement, we know we have to do better for the tourism industry so that they can get through the next year. Thank you, Ashish. Ashish, you're mute. Uh, yeah, I'm going back to my notes here, please. So, my, my soft my word is not moving here, okay? So, but uh, I, I think I'll stick on to my uh, points with, uh, we'll give small businesses a support the need to get back on their feet actually. And uh, we will uh, launch the main uh, street business loan, provided loans up to $200,000. And uh, the Canada's Conservatives will launch the Rebuild Main Street tax credit. Uh, that will be 25% uh, tax credit on amounts of up to $100,000 that Canadians will personally invest in small businesses over the next two years. Thank you. The next question. Municipalities are responsible for delivering many of the services that Canadians and Guelphites rely on every day, from infrastructure to economic development, to basic services like transit, water, and your government strengthen the federal municipal partnership and work with municipalities like the city of Guelph to improve and streamline service delivery. People in cities, towns, and rural areas are tired of waiting for the transit that works for them. While Justin Trudeau loves talking about investing in transit, in too many cities across Canada, people are struggling with transit that is unreliable, expensive, and underfunded. Jagmi and the NDP are committed to fair, free transit in cities across Canada to make life easier for families and to reduce our emissions. We will modernize and expand public transit in communities across Canada with the goal of electrifying transit and other municipal fleets by 2030. And we'll be an active partner in scaling up bus and train service between communities, something rural communities and commuters both need. We will permanently double the Canada Community Building Fund to support municipalities in moving forward on their transit projects and to stimulate local Growth. Thank you, Aisha. Lloyd, you're next. I'll give you a few extra seconds, but not the whole minute. Go ahead. Thank you. And the municipalities are a key partner. And working myself with, with Mayor Guthrie and also with Mike Schreiner, the three of us are joined on, on issues around helping Guelph as a community. And working with uh, the current provincial government to try and get things moving. But we know we've had delays and obstruction going through the provincial channels on cost matching programs. So we've introduced programs through the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, as well as direct application programs with the city of Guelph. An example was the $5 million the city just got to create a circular food economy, scale it across Canada. And that was done as a direct application with no provincial involvement. So we look for those opportunities where we can work together on a direct basis. And transit was mentioned. We were able to work with the city of Guelph to get 35 electric buses into Guelph and an upgrade to our transit garage that could then house the charging stations for those buses. Three separate applications originally weren't connected together we connected them together and were able to get that project landed for Guelph and it's going through implementation now. Thank you, Lloyd. Ashish? Ashish, you need to unmute for every question. Can you repeat that question for me, please? Certainly. So the question at the core is about how your government would strengthen the federal municipal partnership and work with municipalities to improve Okay, I think um, through uh, Canada's, uh, we'll have to go with the key uh, building, key infrastructure plans, which our Conservative Party has. Okay, uh, through uh, Canada's recovery plan, we'll make significant infrastructure, uh, investments in infrastructure to create jobs and get the economy moving. 
A modern Canada needs modern infrastructure. That means connecting all Canadians to high-speed internet and building the necessary transit and roads to keep people and goods moving. The Conservative government will immediately get shovels in the ground on these projects, including transit, road, rail, and broadband projects. Uh, Canada's recovery plan will immediately invest in critical projects that will put hundreds of thousands of Canadians to work, cut commute time and reduce their emissions. We will uh, scrap the failed Canadian infrastructure bank and commit the money sitting unused on its book to infrastructure projects that can strengthen our economy. Thank you, Ashish. Michelle. Thanks. The Green Plan really focuses on giving municipalities greater autonomy. So. Um, we have, again, a list of things that should help them become more autonomous, as, such as working with the infrastructure bank to decrease their interest rates. We would plan to rename the gas tax, the municipal fund, also 1% um, of GST to, that would go to housing and other municipal infrastructure, I think I mentioned before and 3.4 billion for transport. So we want VIA um, across the country and where VIA doesn't go, it would connect with light rail and with buses. So fewer highways, more public transit and give you the municipalities the autonomy to build those in their communities. They know their needs better than the federal government. Thank you. We're going to move on to the next section, we have only a few more questions left. We're on to climate change and the first person to answer will be Lloyd. All parties have acknowledged the seriousness and need for urgent and, uh, action on climate change. What are you doing personally to fight climate change and how will you impact your party's approach to accelerating action? to get to the unmute button. Uh, personally, my wife and I have had solar panels on our roof for many years, so about a decade now. Um, we're doing what we can in terms of recycling and composting. I volunteer with the Guelph Tool Library and looking at how do we keep appliances from going into landfill. In our platform, we have right to repair uh, legislation. We weren't able to get through the, the house uh, in time for the, uh, the end of the session, but we'll be reintroducing that legislation within 100 days of being reelected. Doing our part individually and as a community, Guelph, Guelph is a leader in this area. I mentioned the circular food economy. It's another area that Guelph, reducing food waste, buying local. I sat on the Environment Committee and I also sat on public accounts. We we're working on all this stuff as well with the federal government. Thanks, Lloyd. Ashish? Yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, thanks, uh, Shakiba, for that question here. And um, being a toxicologist, uh, environment and climate change is um, very close to my heart personally. And um, I've been involved with this field for almost 22 years now. Uh, and I'm really uh, proud to say that the party is very serious about um, uh, with environment and climate change, and we have a, a great uh, recover, um, plan in, the, in that regard. And uh, as Canada's conservatives, we have a serious plan to combat uh, climate change that allows us to meet our targets and reduce emissions by 2030. Uh, we have an independent uh, Uh, analysis conducted by Navius Research found that the plan would achieve the same emission reductions as the government's current plan in 2030, and not where the government's Canadians all by hurting the economy. Thank you, Ashish. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, personally, I like the phrase "be an imperfect environmentalist." So don't wait till you're perfect to take action. Eat vegan sometimes, use what you have, research new things. It was really important to me that we walk the talk in my campaign. So for residential lawn signs, we have reusable shopping bags instead of plastic signs. And on Friday, we're having volunteer appreciation. So instead of printing t-shirts, the Guelph Tool Library 
is going to come by and silk screen our logo on existing t-shirts. With respect to what the pardon is the only plan that will really get us where we need to be on climate change, and hopefully we'll have a bit more time to talk about that, but 60% reductions by 2030 and a whole list of other things. <laughs> Thanks, Michelle. Aisha. Lloyd, I believe that you are sincerely committed to action on climate change. You said in your ad in the paper this week that you have obtained funding for planting 1,500 new trees in Guelph and for installing 30 EV charging stations. Those are great things. The problem is you don't seem to recognize that this is a global crisis. We can't tackle it by just planting trees around town. We need transformational change of our economy and our lifestyles. While Mr. Trudeau has been prime minister, Canada's greenhouse gas emissions have increased every year. He set up a carbon tax, but then he gave the biggest corporate polluters exemptions from it. And then he bought an oil pipeline with taxpayers' dollars. You can set targets but you'll never reach them if you're running in the wrong direction. Oh, and Ashish, your leader can't even convince his own party that climate change is real. Thank you, Aisha. Lloyd, I'm gonna give you 30 seconds. Thank you, and just to emphasize that I absolutely see that climate change is a global crisis. We have to do what we can, can as individuals, as a community, as a province, and as a country. The federal program is there to backstop provinces so they can have pricing mechanisms in place. And we are exceeding our 2030 targets. We're on track to, to, to save 36% greenhouse gas emissions by 2030, now increasing those targets to 40 to 45%, and we'll continue to do so as we accelerate forward. Thank you. Ashish? Yeah, I, I should just mention my name here. I, I, I'll say that again, that we are very serious about the climate change and environmental protection, but uh, we will fight climate change and protect the environment. But as we say that we have uh, families uh, which are dependent upon fossil fuels, so we have to transition out of it. So there's a human component to it. We can't uh, immediately stop these things. We have to transition out of them. And um, so, I, I think that would be my answer there. So we have to be uh, cognizant of the fact that um, Albertans are our fellow Canadians. So we have to, we, we can't just um, uh, stop fossil fuels instantaneously and let those families suffer. Okay, thank you, Ashish. Um, the first to begin the next question, still on climate change, how does your party plan to address climate change while maintaining Okay, I addressed a couple of issues in my last answer, so it's just a continuation uh, from the previous. And um, so um, instead of um, like a carbon tax, specifically in that regard, instead of sending your money to Ottawa, we'll have a low carbon savings account to help uh, Canadians make green lifestyle choices while allowing them to decide what works best for their family. Um, regarding the low carbon savings account, uh, Canada's conservatives will work with the provinces to implement an innovative and national person low carbon savings account. These LCSAs will in incentivize Canadians to make greener lifestyle choices that reduce emissions while also allowing them to decide uh, what works best for them and their family. The approach to carbon pricing leverages the fact that Canadians want to do the right thing and a better position than government to decide how and what works best for the environment. Thank you, Ashish. Michelle. As I mentioned before, I think the Greens are the only party with a realistic plan to actually move the needle for Canadians. We're the only party that will reduce emissions by 60% by 2030, have interim targets that are measurable by 2023, cancel all new oil and gas explor exploration and subsidies. So as she said, we can't just stop. And I agree, we can't stop, but we can't continue to expand. That's not the way to wind down. 
With respect to the second half of the question, we have great green innovation. So we're hoping to have entrepreneur and residents increase R&D spending to 2.5% in line with other OECD average countries and invest in research that's really been lacking. It's been decreasing instead of increasing. So we have this huge opportunity on the green future bandwagon. Thanks, Michelle. Aisha? Canada happens to be the element. Under Trudeau, we have the weakest 2030 climate target of any G7 country. The Liberals have spent more on fossil fuels on average compared to Stephen... Harper. The NDP is committed to creating hundreds of thousands of good paying jobs by investing in clean energy, energy efficient affordable homes, electric transit, zero emissions vehicles. Retrofit all climate bank to invest in fighting the climate emergency instead of an infrastructure bank that only aims to enrich the rich investors. Thank, Thank you. you, Lloyd. Thanks, Shakiba. It's a challenge to do these answers in, in a minute. Uh, I'm gonna focus on a very narrow area because of our time limit, limitations, and that's the zero emission vehicles and the net zero accelerator fund, an eight billion dollar businesses accelerate to net zero. I co-chair the Automotive Caucus, huge opportunity for Canadian businesses that are feeding into the supply chain now that all of the Detroit three are going to be going to zero emission vehicles on their assembly lines. So there is an economic opportunity as we accelerate into the green, the next green economy coming out of COVID and Guelph is gonna be very well positioned to participate at all levels of that. Thank you, Lloyd. Before moving to closing remarks, I'd like to ask a question about accessibility. And we will begin with Michelle. According to the 2017 Canadian Survey on Disability, more than 6 million Canadians aged 15 and over identify with having a disability. And it ex is expected that the actual numbers are li likely higher than that. However, only 60% of Canadians with disabilities aged 25 to 64 are employed compared to 80% of Canadians without disabilities. People with disabilities earn less than Canadians without disabilities and are more likely to live in poverty. How will your party improve accessibility and promote inclusion for everyone in Canada? Michelle. Thanks for the question. Um, the first thing the Greens wanna do is create a disability act. So right now, there's lots of kind of different hodgepodge policies that are meant to help people with disabilities. So we really want to bring it under one umbrella and focus on what people with disabilities really need. As I said before, we'd mandate 30% of housing, new housing would be accessible for persons with disabilities. And of course, guaranteed livable income income, our social safety net are going to make life better because right now people can't live on what they get with disability support. But if their housing was affordable, they had a guaranteed livable income, they didn't have to worry about health care or pharmacare, um, life would be a lot better. Thank you, Aisha. Too many barriers can continue to exist for Canadians living with disabilities. And it's time to take action now and change it. Canadians living with disabilities and their families deserve equality, accessibility, and inclusion. The Liberals are all talk and no action on disabilities. It took them four years to introduce an accessibility act that was deeply flawed and still hasn't been completely fixed. Jagmeet Singh will fight for Canadians with disabilities by fixing the Accessibility Act and working to improve accessibility, including making standards more enforceable. By expanding and improving employment programs and by working with Canadians living with autism spectrum disorder to create a national autism strategy. This will give Canadians that have autism 
an opportunity to use their voice and to speak for themselves, a seat at the table. And it is so important. Thank you. Lloyd. Thanks. I was very pleased to be part of the discussion in the House over the Disability Benefit Act and looking at ways to improve people, people's access to employment and to get people out of poverty because of their disability. Um, over the last six years, we've We've been working on inclusion programs for people with disabilities. Some of those have ended up in downtown Guelph with accessibility to businesses locally. But we have to go beyond that. We have a labor crisis in Canada and we need everybody to be able to participate at whatever level they're able to. So more flexible rules and, 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 and regulations around employment of people that need to be accommodated. And that's something that we need to work on with our provincial partners as well. So the, the Disability Benefit Act is something that would be introduced early in the next session of Parliament so that we can complete the very important work of helping these Canadians access the services they need. Thanks, Lloyd. Ashish? I, uh, thank you, uh, Shakiba. I wish I had more than 60 seconds to answer this. This is a very important topic. And uh, so uh, we, uh, we must break down barriers for Canadian living with disabilities. Okay? And that's very important to me as a person and very important to me, our, our party as well. Uh, Canada's conservatives will have a plan to break down the barriers faced by Canadians living with disabilities. Uh, Canada's recovery plan will double the disability supplement and uh, Canada's workers benefit from $713 to $1,500, providing a major boost to lower income Canadians with disabilities on top of an increase in the Canada workers benefit. The most help will go to families where one member has a disability. Okay, And we'll also overhaul the complex area of disability supports and benefits to ensure that workers always leaves uh, someone further ahead. And uh, we will provide additional $80 million per year through enabling accessibility funds, um, which will help uh, in this cause. Thank you, Ashish. Thank you to all of you. We will now move to closing statements. And closing statements will be presented in reverse order from opening remarks, which means we begin with Ashish Sachin, Conservative Party of Canada. Okay, uh, thank you, Shakiba. Thank you, everybody here. And. Um, um, while the COVID-19 pandemic has presented our nation with unprecedented circumstances, I commend the sacrifices and hardships of frontline workers that will involve Asia here as well, uh, and the citizens in dealing with uh, the, this pandemic. Uh, this election is a choice between a comprehensive conservative plan to deliver jobs for all Canadians and to restore proper management of public finances. This election is how we get Canada back on its feet and rebuild our economy and jobs and our way of life. September 20th, 2021 will be the third opportunity for Canadians to offer a referendum on a party and a leader who has expanded national debt to record levels, continuously engaged in ethical breaches and scandals and has failed to deliver on promises time and time again. Erin O'Toole and Canada's Conservatives are the only alternative to secure the future restore competence, transparency, and accountability to government, and to ensure Canada is never unprepared for crisis again. With a riding uh, as a known leader in climate solutions, Gulf, is partner Gulf in partnership with Canada's conservatives will have the necessary resources to build economic prosperity, and with your support, place Canada at the forefront of international effort. Should I have the honor to serve as elected MP for Gulf, I will dedicate my time in Ottawa to work honestly and with integrity to represent the interest of citizens of this wonderful city. Thank you and God bless. Thank you, Ashish. Lloyd Longfield, Liberal Party of Canada. Thank you, Shakib, and thanks to the Chamber for having this discussion and getting to 20 questions. Congratulations on that. We, when we were elected, there was no pandemic. I can remember my priorities at that time were the climate crisis and how are we going to work together? A student at uh, John McRae School said to me, instead of politicians fighting each other, why don't you fight climate change? And I took that into my office and said, we need to focus on that question and how do we work together to solve the big problems? problems like climate change. 
A few months later, we were hit with COVID. The same rule applies. We shouldn't be fighting each other. We need to fight against COVID to get Canadians back on their feet and to get us through this health crisis that we're facing globally, positioning Canada to lead on our way out of the health crisis and into the next economy. So working together, not fighting each other as politicians or different orders of government. How do we work with the municipality, the provinces and territories, indigenous partners to solve the big problems together? The problems that will solve the climate crisis, but will also solve the, solve the health crisis and get us all back on our feet working together. Thank you, Lloyd. Aisha Jangir, New Democratic Party of Canada. Thank you. Friends, new Democrats are different. For our whole, for, for our whole history, we have fought for better working conditions and standards that lift everyone up. We know that good jobs treat people and treating people fairly make a difference to Canadian families and that setting Canadians up for success in the work world of the future benefits us all. New ways of thinking can shape the recovery from the COVID-19 crisis, help make our economy fairer, and deliver the results we all want. What we have seen over the past six years is a Liberal Prime Minister who loves to say the right thing, to promise to address the issues that matter to Canadians, but with no intentions of delivering them. Liberals have been promising pharmacare and childcare for decades. Earlier in the debate, Lloyd admitted that there are cracks in the healthcare system. And I thank you for admitting that they are cracks. There's more than just cracks, but he blames Harper. He blames the provinces and he never accepts his government's own responsibility. In May, 2020, 15 months ago, Jagmeet Singh called on Justin Trudeau to introduce paid sick leave. He said, he said provinces need to look at the way to deliver sick leave directly for, through employers which, a, which the federal government can't do. On September 20th, I hope that you will consider electing me as your MP so that I can fight for you every single day. Thank That's you, Aisha. That's my pledge to you. Thank you. Michelle Bowman, Green Party of Canada. Thanks again to the chamber and the other participants and the audience. Um, this was my first debate, so I'm new at this. Um, what I'm going to say is the window to avoid the worst effects of climate change is closing this decade. So this is Canada's last chance, last election to do our part to tackle climate change. In another two to four years, it's going to be too late. We have this enormous opportunity of a lifetime to capitalize on the new green economy. COVID highlighted so many social safety net problems. And the research shows that it saves money to pay for these things beforehand, before people get in trouble. Guaranteed livable income, pharmacare, housing. The last thing I can promise you is better governments. Governments, more cooperation. I've heard about cooperation. That concludes this debate. I would like to thank the Guelph and District Association of Realtors for making this event possible. Thank you to the audience who joined us live this afternoon. I'd also like to thank the candidates for your commitment and desire to serve our community. A reminder to everyone, you may vote now at our local Elections Canada office at the Silver Creek Centre Plaza located at 292 Speedvale Avenue West and at advance polls on September 10th, 11th, 12th and 13th or on election day on September 20th. Your voice matters, please vote. Thank you.